down by sorrow is there a life weighed down by care come to the cross each burden bearing all your anxiety
This Sunday, there is a move that is taking place across the world that is calling the church to a time of fasting and prayer, in particular on this day, this Sunday. And I wanted to preach a message today along the ministry, along the lines of the ministry of prayer, because I think it is something we desperately need right now. We are in trying times, and God is a prayer answering God. Before I get into the message, let me thank those who have come to help us tonight put this together. Of course, my wife Linda. Jerry Waddell was playing the keyboard. Tommy Kennedy's playing the guitar, and his wife Kim and their daughter uh, Katie are back on the media and sound. And we want to congratulate Tommy and Kim. They added a title to their family this week. They're called Grandparents now. And we celebrate with them with, is Carter, is that correct? So we welcome Carter Kennedy to the family. I'm going to be reading from James chapter 4 in just a moment, so I hope you have a Bible close by, and I would encourage you to take that out quickly and turn there. And we're going to be reading a passage that is quite familiar, because James is such a popular book among many. So if you would start reading with me, follow along as I read verses 1 through 3. James said, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. The message I want to share with you tonight, really, the core of this message is one that comes from a sermon that was preached by my dear friend and mentor, Dr. Bill Neese, many, many years ago. And when I heard him preach this message, it struck me so that I have preached this on more than one occasion, but I wanted to revisit it because it is so timely and it applies so to our situation. What happens when God doesn't answer? What happens when we pray and we ask God and then the heavens seem to be silent? Now, let me say this. God is looking for a people who will pray. The scripture is filled with promises and words of encouragement for the man or woman who will give themselves over to the ministry of prayer. For example, Matthew 7 and 7. Jesus said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. In John chapter 14, Jesus gave us this promise, And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Son may, be, may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Beloved, these are just two examples of who knows how many actual promises there are found in the Word like this. And every one of these promises is an encouragement for you and me to become men and women of prayer. In Luke chapter 18, the first verse, then Jesus told His disciples a parable to show them that they should pray and not give up. But I want us to focus tonight primarily on this text from James chapter 4. Because here James underscores for us two very serious problems that we find in this matter of prayer. The first one is this, the problem of unoffered prayers. Again, look at James 4 and verse 2. 
The latter part of that verse says, you do not have because you do not ask God. Now, that brings up a very valid question. Could it be that the biggest problem that the church is having to face today is not the problem of unoffered or unanswered prayer, but unoffered prayer? Could it be that the great sin of the majority who profess to be Christians today is the fact that we simply are not men and women of prayer as the Word of God compels us to be? We genuinely just don't offer prayer to begin with. And because of that, we don't get answers because we aren't seriously asking God. In 1 Samuel chapter 12, in the 23rd verse, Samuel, the prophet, gave these words of comfort to the people of Israel when they were troubled. He said, As for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you. See, what he's saying is, if I, if I fail in my responsibility to pray for you, then I falter at the task of asking God in your behalf. And if I fail there, I am sinning against God himself. So that's the first problem, unoffered prayer. And then James identifies the second problem, and that's unanswered prayer. Look again at verse 3. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Now, listen carefully to what James is saying. He's saying, oh, you're, you pray, okay, you, you say the words, but you're not getting an answer when you pray. And there are reasons for that. See, unanswered prayer is a frustrating experience. And all of us have had that experience at one time or another. In, in fact, uh, like I said, it's me and, what, about four other folks here tonight. But if we had a church filled with people tonight, we could ask every single one, have you ever had a time when you prayed about a matter and you prayed about it for a long period of time and an answer never came? It, it's frustrating because you begin to think maybe there's not an answer. And, and it causes you a lot, a lot of mental despair. It's kind of like putting the key in the ignition of a car and, and turning the key and then nothing happens? All of us have experienced that at one time or another. Well, let me ask you to think back to that. The time you tried to start your car and it wouldn't start, did you decide at that moment, cars don't work? I'm not going to ever use a car again because I tried it and it didn't work. Well, you know, that's the way it is for a lot of Christians. They, they hear a sermon like this on prayer. They read all the promises that are made in the Word of God uh, regarding prayer, where God says, if prayer is offered in my name, if prayer is offered for my glory, I will answer you. But then we do all the things we think we're supposed to do. We lay all the groundwork that we think is required, and we pray, and nothing happens. Has it ever happened to you? I want you to ask yourself, what did I do when that happened? Did you, did you say something like, well, you know, I tried it. I gave it a shot, but it didn't work. I prayed, I didn't get an answer, so apparently prayer is not for me, or the Word of God's not true. Maybe God just really didn't mean it when He said it. He, maybe He's talking about something else or talking to somebody else, but not me. Beloved, we have to be careful not to write God off with, with, with a statement or with thinking like that. And please hear me what I'm about to say. I believe with all of my heart that God means everything He says in His Word, and He always says what He means. But our problem is, we get into these frustrating situations where we don't get the answer we're expecting or the answer we would like to get, and so... We tend to take the Word of God and we try to pull it down to the level of our frustration instead of trying to lift our experience up to the level of the Word of God. Many times we've prayed and we've failed to get an answer and so we rationalize. Maybe I read it wrong. Maybe God didn't mean exactly what this says. Maybe I'm being too specific. Or maybe I'm not being specific enough. 
And it's easy to rationalize. It's even easier to make excuses. But when we do that, we tend to devalue the Word of God and the promises in that Word. You know, I don't know about you, but I want everything that God has promised. I want all of those promises that He said are mine. In fact, He implies that those promises are like a birthright to us. And if that's the case, why should we settle for anything else? But we have to face the facts, and, and this is a painful realization. If my experience doesn't measure up to the Word of God, there's nothing wrong with the Word of God. The problem is with me. And so I need to look at my life, and I need to determine what I'm missing or what I'm failing to, to do to accomplish this ministry of prayer. I believe the majority of people under the, under the sound of my voice believe in the ministry of prayer. Yet at the same time, if you are comfortable enough to, ad, to ad, admit it, at least to yourself, you would say there have been a lot of times and there have been a lot of things that I've prayed about as best as I know how. I've prayed about them in Jesus' name, like he said to do. I've done everything I know how to do in order to try to, to get that issue before God, but I never got an answer, and I don't know why. So what is the problem? Have you ever been there? You've prayed about a particular thing, but it seems like heaven is, is, is out, out for lunch. There's no answer. There's, there's no response. Well, if we've prayed sincerely, if we've asked God for an answer and we didn't get it, what can we do? Well, I want to give you a couple of steps, a couple of examinations to, to take in order to determine where the issue is. To start with, closely examine yourself. You see, the cause for failure in getting answers to your prayer may lie within you. So evaluate two things. Look at, the, look at how you're living, look at your lifestyle, and ask yourself, is there any sin in my life? And that's a hard question, folks. But it has to be addressed because sin will derail your prayers every time. If you're living in sin, if you're living in disobedience, even if nobody else knows about it, even if it is, it is a completely secret sin, if you're hiding it, you're not, going to, you're not going to receive answers to your prayers. So, beloved, if, if you're not living up to what God expects, then you need to look closely at yourself. In fact, listen to this. Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. And David wrote that famous verse in, in Psalm 66 and verse 18 that says, If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Now, there's an ongoing debate that has raised itself to the surface multiple times over the many years. And it's the question, does God hear the prayers of sinners? There, you see, there are some people who say God hears every prayer. And then you've got folks in another camp that says God doesn't hear the prayer of the disobedient. Well, well you know, we need to look at this issue honestly and try, and try to approach it logically. I mean, logic says, certainly, God hears the sounds of the words. He hears every sound that is made. But you know, the Bible always equates hearing with God answering. And where the Scripture says, I will not hear you, He's not talking about not hearing the words coming out of your mouth. He's saying, if your life is not what it is supposed to be, if you're living in disobedience, I'm not going to answer you. If there's sin in your life, if you're living in disobedience... You've thrown a hindrance in the way. And God is saying, I won't answer. 1 John 3, verse 21 and 22 gives us a condition for answered prayer. Listen to this. John said, Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God 
and receive from him anything we ask. Now, why is this? Because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. And by the way, the word obey and the word do in those two verses are written in the present tense in the original Greek, which means we're supposed to continue obeying. We're supposed to continue doing the things that God wants us to do. And that means our way of life, our living, because we need to set our lifestyle in a direction that is towards God. That means the person who just obeys God every now and then really can't expect to have his prayers answered because he hasn't met the criteria. Because, beloved, it's the life that prays. That's why James said what he did in chapter 5, verse 16 of his letter. He said, the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. So if you pray and you don't get an answer, the first thing you need to look at is yourself. And examine your, your, your living, your motives, everything about you. And, and, and carefully examine yourself before you pray. The second thing you need to do if, after you've examined yourself is start looking at the motive. Why are you praying this way? Again, James 4 and 3. James says, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. See, he's saying you're praying with the wrong motive. Let me say it this way. A selfish reason behind a prayer will not get an answer to that prayer. I mean, have you ever known anybody that, or had somebody come to you and say, hey, pray that uh, God will give me a raise in my salary. Or pray that uh, I get this job promotion. Or pray that I get a, get a higher income. I mean, it, it, all right, let's back up a little bit. The person making the request, are they living a life that's honoring God right now? Are they respecting and loving God in the way they, they handle themselves? And if not, honestly... Why would we ask God to increase their material wealth if they're not exercising spiritual discipline? I mean, we do this every Sunday. We pray for somebody's physical healing, right? They, a person may be afflicted. They, they may, may be in great need. But let me ask you this. If that person isn't a Christian, if he doesn't care about the Lord, if he doesn't care about the church... Is that really a proper thing to pray for? I mean, look at it this way. We need to be praying about his eternal soul first. Because if God were to heal him physically, would he then just go on living in sin as he had been and just disregarding the Lord? I mean, do you see where I'm coming from? I mean, we can pray that God will convict him of his sin. And bring him to repentance. Because that is his greatest need. In fact, I want you to think about this with me for just a moment. Think about the crucifixion. There were two men crucified on either side of Jesus. Remember the unrepentant thief? The one who demanded, if you're the Christ, save yourself and us too? What was Jesus' response to that man? Best I can tell, he didn't even acknowledge him and you know why because there was no repentance in that man's request but the other thief he said with a with a contrite heart lord remember me when you come into your kingdom and jesus answered him and said i tell you the truth today you'll be with me in paradise Look at that. One man's prayer was answered and the other one was ignored because of the motive behind the requests. So if we want our prayers answered, we've got to ask this question. Why am I praying? You know, Jesus only gave us one acceptable motive for prayer and it's found in John 14 and 13. That verse says, I will do whatever you ask in my name. Here it is, so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. So Jesus has a primary purpose, and that purpose is to glorify His Father in heaven. And if you and I will pray with that motive, God will hear. All right? Let me be transparent. There have been a lot of times that I've had to stop and confess that my motives were less than proper as I was praying about certain things. I mean, why do I want... 
whatever it is I'm asking for. I mean, if, I'm to, if I were to pray for, for a powerful spiritual revival and a renewal to sweep through Ridgeline Church, is it because it would get a big write-up in the national publications of the Church of God? Is it because the churches around the state would say, man, aren't they doing great things down there in Chattanooga? You see, if that's the reason I pray for revival, that's a wrong motive. If it's so that we can go to state ministers' meetings and, and drop the word on our peers, man, you, you folks ought to come down our way and see what's happening for yourself. Do you see how wrong that is? If the motive is something to brag about or just to grow for the sake of numbers, that motive is wrong. So why do you pray? And why do you want God to answer? Is James speaking to you when he says, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives? Beloved, if you pray and God doesn't answer, the first thing you have to do is look within yourself. E e examine your own life. And then if everything in your life seems to be proper, then check the motive behind your prayers. And if everything seems to be in order, the next thing to do is to take a close look at the prayer itself. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. This is the assurance we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. So our prayer has to be in concert with His will. And if you want to know what the will of God is, then read the book. Because this is where the will of God is made known to us. And let me say this about the will of God. He has a plan and a will for you that is completely different from His plan and His will for me. And everybody you know who claims to be a follower of Christ is going to have a, a different plan and a different will. I mean, let me use physical healing as an example. We pray for the physical healing of people every week. But there are some people that we have prayed for and we have bombarded the throne of heaven for that sick person and, they're ne and they were never healed. Why? Well, you're never going to find it spelled out in the scripture where it says that in every situation, under every circumstance, that the sick are going to be made well. Now, this is thin ice here for some, and I'll probably get some, some, some mail about this one. But I've had my share of preachers say that if we ask, God will heal everyone. Now, if that be the case, then no one would ever die. Because death comes through sickness. You say, but now wait a minute there, Pastor. I thought the Bible said that healing was a part of the atonement. It is. But so is the glorification of the body. Heaven is a part of the atonement. But I haven't experienced that yet. Have you? You see, there are some things that Jesus purchased for us on the cross that we have not yet experienced. They are in the future, but we look forward to them with great hope and anticipation. I mean, I've, I've said this to you before. The, the, the Bible calls this physical body the body of humiliation. And like Brother Nice used to say, he said, My, it's the body of humiliation and mine is humiliating me more every day. But it's a natural thing and it's a fact. It's a fact that declares the unique will of God for every life. And God's will is ultimate. Listen to this passage. Revelation 21, 3 and 4. Now the dwelling of God is with men, and He will live with them. They will be His people, and God Himself will be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Think about this. No more aches, no more pains, no more wheelchairs, no more, no more bifocals, because God will ultimately give every one of us perfect help. And you'll have it in heaven as you live with the Lord. So understand, beloved, we get in trouble if we try to tell God 
how he ought to carry out his will for us. And if we honestly want God to be glorified, and if we honestly want to see his will accomplished, then we have to pray and give God the freedom to work his will as he chooses. So if you fast and you pray and your prayer isn't answered, look within yourself first. Examine your lifestyle. Look closely at your motives. And if everything checks out, look at the prayer itself. Make sure you're praying according to the will of God. And if all of these things seem to be where they need to be, the next thing for you to do is to look to God Himself. I want you to listen to what God said in Isaiah 55. This is verse 9. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my, way, my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. You know, sometimes God may answer our prayers in a different way than we expected. You remember, remember Paul's thorn in the flesh? On three different occasions, he says, he prayed and took that matter to God and asked him to free him from that affliction. And God said, finally, and this is a paraphrase, he said, no, Paul, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to answer your prayer now, but not in the way you expected. You see, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to allow you to keep the thorn, but I'm going to give you the grace you'll need to bear it. And that way, I'll receive more glory and more honor. Now listen to Paul's response. This is found in 2 Corinthians 12. He says, So for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. And you could substitute the word thorns there. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. Listen, God often takes what appears to be obvious to us and he flips it. I mean, think about it. When God was, was getting ready to send his son into the world, man's logic would say God would send him to the largest, most powerful nation on the earth to reveal himself to the world. I mean, that would be the logical choice. But what did he do? He picked one of the smallest, most non-threatening, weakest nations around. He chose Israel. And the obvious would say that this coming Son of God would be born in luxury. He would be born in royalty. He would be, be, brought, be born in a position of power, right? But instead, God tapped an unknown young virgin maiden came upon her by the Holy Spirit and welcomed his son into the world through the convenience of a cattle barn. You see, often God will take the obvious and he'll flip it. I think that's what Paul meant when he wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 that God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things, and the things that are not, to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before Him. Beloved, when you pray and you don't get an answer, then look to God, because His answer may be something completely different from what you're anticipating. And while we're here, consider this. Sometimes God's timetable is completely different from ours. His schedule is not the same as yours. Now, 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 now notice, He's not playing games with you, mind you. But He's going to give you what you need when you need it the most. So let Him answer according to His schedule. Let me give you an example of that. Hannah in the Old Testament. The Bible says that year after year after year, she would accompany her husband to the temple. And she would pray that God would give her a son. 
And it seemed like when that prayer was not going to be answered, at just the right time, God answered her prayer. But look at this. God not only gave her a son, he gave Israel a prophet. There was a lot more in the answer than Hannah ever expected. Do you know what this says to me? God can run my life a whole lot better than I can. And to be honest, looking back over my life, it's a good thing that God didn't always listen to me. Because sometimes the things that I was asking for, in hindsight, weren't the things that were best for me. But God knows what is best. So that means whatever God has brought into your life is best for you. You may not be able to recognize that right now, but God knows. And things in your life may be tough right now, but hang on. Because in God's promise, there's lasting peace and there's victory. And it's ours if we'll continue to trust in the wisdom and the grace of God. Beloved, if God loves you enough to give you His Son, do you think He would withhold anything of lesser importance to you? If He delays the answer... It's so that He can answer your prayer in a better way than you asked for. So if you fasted and you prayed, and it seems that God hasn't heard you, first thing, look at yourself. Examine your life to make sure you're living in a way that is pleasing to God. If you find your life in proper perspective, then examine your motives. Very carefully determine and identify why you are asking what you are asking. And if that is proper, then look at the prayer itself and be sure that what you're asking is according to the will of God. And if you find that you are praying according to His will, then look at God Himself because His answer may be different. It may be delayed. But know this, for you, His answer will be the best one. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can put our faith and trust in you. We thank you that we can bring the cares and the concerns of life to you. We thank you that you are a God who hears and answers prayer. Lord, forgive us if we're guilty of, of praying with a wrong motive or praying without a clean heart or praying in a manner that is not according to your will. God, help us line ourselves up with that which you have, have with the guidelines you have laid out for us and help us pray looking to you trusting you and believing that at just the right time, you will answer. We love you, Lord, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, beloved.